If you notice the revivals that have taken place previously, the revivals usually will touch light on something. The one of Martin Luther, which was one of the big ones, it came and he was talking about, you know, justification by faith. And he was supposed to bring us into salvation experience. We birthed the Lutherans, birthed the Anglicans, birthed, you know, churches along those lines, which had to do with salvation, which was started out in the Europe. The one of, of, of uh, um, uh, William Seymour, the Azusa Street, which, which is another major one, was focused on Pentecost, infilling with the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and that spread like wildfire from Los Angeles in Azusa Street, spread to the whole world. But guess what? Another one is coming from Africa. It's going to touch light on the gospel of the kingdom, establishing believers, discipleship, raising people to follow the Lord. Now, if you check Africa, just to do a little, you know, history, you see that there was a man God sent to Africa, Nigeria to be precise, Elisha to be precise, who had that gospel of the kingdom in his heart by the name Pius the Elton. He came to, I mean, all he just did was discipleship, but we have not recovered from his impact. All the fathers and patriarchs we have today that we respect and we receive and drink from, all our fathers in the faith, they stream from this one man. Beginning from Apostle Babalola and Pai Daosa, streaming down. Daddy Wale, okay. We have Baba Deboe, we have Pastor Kumui, streaming down from just that one, one person. And then we have it flowing down. We have all the apostolic teachers we have today, and everyone God is raising to teach. And to establish disciples and raise up people for the Lord. This is so important now like never before. Because when revival comes, it should actually achieve three things. Any revival that comes must achieve three things. It could achieve more, but these three are very major. These three are very major. The first is that there will be an intense and an extraordinary palpable presence of God. Anytime there's revival, that presence is what shapes the atmosphere, is what shapes the culture, shapes the civilization. That was what happened with Charles G. Finney in Rochester Town, New York. Revival was in town. People, people didn't even have time to go watch circus. Circus came to town. Only three people attended. The honky tonk joints, beer joints were shut down. Rate of criminality crashed. Even, you know, the, the policemen, the attorneys submitted clean bill of no criminality. The prisons were emptied. Everyone wanted to see God because God's presence was strong there. Charles Finney didn't need to preach in some places. Just in passing by where you were at, you were under conviction. Sometimes he was in the train and he was just riding by. People were under conviction. Went to visit some warehouse one day. They, they couldn't continue working. Everyone knelt down and were receiving Jesus with no message. People's knees were knocking together. People wanted to know the Lord because of that presence of God. God's presence can't be in a place as it should be. And people will be able to boldly live in sin. When that kind of thing happened in the past, in the time of Achan, we know what Israel suffered. They had to trace him till they picked him out. That was tracing sin and dealing with sin. These are days where sin comes and goes unattended. Swept under the carpet. Nobody's saying anything about it. When somebody was going to dare something in the camp of the Israelites, I mean, this guy was so bold, he took a lady and was going to have, you know, some form of fornication with the guy. Phineas went after the guy and pinned him to the ground and God said his wrath has been averted. That was the way they could keep God's presence by keeping sin out. God's presence will be palpable, will be feelable, will be strong, will be real, will be so evident. The second thing, there will be a strong desire to get rid of all sin. Strong desire to get rid of all sin. Now, mark this. You know, anytime we come around this sin subject, because of the, our learning, where it comes to this, you know, hyper grace teachings, we're always saying, oh, yes, I have the nature of righteousness. And we're not always, you know, that doesn't allow you to deal with this sin issue. This is just something that was introduced by the devil. It will not allow us to go anywhere. Sin is the only weapon of the devil that can dismantle God's purpose. That's the only weapon of the devil. He doesn't mind if you are making progress, so to speak, 
you're having numbers, you're having what you call impact. If sin has been sown into the midst of the fabrics of that group or that fellowship or that congregation, the devil is happy. Go on doing what you're doing. Because it will spread like canker and it will flow through everywhere. Now, this getting rid of sin, the way the Holy Spirit explained it to me, has to do with deep cleansing. Can you say deep cleansing? I'm sure ladies will know this better. Deep cleansing is that cleansing that has different layers. It begins with a, a first cleansing. After that cleansing, then it moves further into something they call steaming. After the steaming, they begin to do extractions of debris, dead cells, exfoliation of those things. As the exfoliation takes place, then they now put, apply a mask. So it's layers of cleansing. Hallelujah. Amen. Layers of cleansing. Sometimes sin is like that. Our eyes are snapping things. Our ears are listening to things. We are involved in things. And there are layers on our soul over time. The Bible says the righteous soul of Lot was vexed by the iniquity which he saw from day to day. So it was not an overnight thing. His righteous soul gradually became vexed. And he was almost going to be swallowed up in that iniquity. So, he, I mean, it wasn't going to be something that you're just going to pour water on you and say you are clean. I'm sure you remember very well when we were younger, especially, I mean, the young men. The cleansing was for the ladies. I'm sure the ladies liked that part. Young men, when we went out to play football and you didn't want your parents to know you had sustained an injury, what do we do then? Different things, stupid things. We could pour sand on the, pour sand on the injury. And cover it up. Guess what? That thing you covered, you will soon find out two days after. When you wake up and you have lymph node on your thighs or under your armpit, depending on where the wound, where the wound is. Then when you check the wound, you think it's, it's, you know, getting healed. But there will just be a layer, a thin layer. That layer is a little supple. If you press it, pus will come out of it. Smelly pus. That's how sin is. That's how sin is. That wound will not be healed until the very person you are hiding it from, it is exposed to that person. That's the way sin operates. It thrives in secrecy. It thrives in secrecy. Takes you farther than you want to go. Makes you pay more than you bargain to pay for. Takes you deeper than you, I mean, you, 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 can, you can ever reach. When that person, your mom, gets to find out that you are limping, she will now do what exactly you didn't want her to do. She will apply, first of, before spirit, you first of all use warm water to wash open all the pores so that fresh blood can come out. When fresh blood comes out, you will now feel the pain afresh like you just had the injury. That's how to deal with sin. It has to be exposed and dealt with. When fresh blood comes out, then they will now start applying the cleaning agents. Spirit and all those hydro, I mean, hydrogen peroxide and all those things. Before they now put, depending on what, what treatment they need to put, maybe antibiotics or something on it, for it to now heal properly. They will now leave it open, no covering. Let it heal properly. Hallelujah. That's how to deal with sin. So there will be a strong desire in people to get rid of sin. A strong desire to get rid of sin. That when there was once upon a time a revival that took place in a certain place, somewhere in Guatemala, Almolonga. This revival was radical. A revival that didn't only affect churches, affect, you know, the nativity. It affect their vegetation. If you Google now, Almolonga carrot, it's a very big, huge carrot. Their vegetables were so fresh, so luscious, so big. Revival affected their vegetation. Affected their, I mean, the community. Stealing, killing, those things were things of the past. The very atmosphere was cleansed. We can't say we have revival now. And that's exactly what we need. The third thing that happens when there's a revival is that there is a powerful impact on the wider community. You know, revival is one of those words that look like, you know, this accordion or, the, you know, the, this, this instrument of music, this wind instrument you pull back and forth. It's called accordion. 
you know, it's just like that, or concertina. It can be shrunk to an individual level, but it can be expanded to a group where it can now affect a territory. It can begin with one person, but that fire, that's why you know this team is catch the fire, but you can't keep that fire. You have to spread the fire. But you must first catch that fire. It can begin with only you. You know, revival is a cry. A cry going up to heaven. Psalm 85 verse 6 says, Will thou not revive us that your people may rejoice in thee? Will you not revive us? A cry, a question. Sometimes it looks as if it's not going to come. And then everyone wants to continue with what they're doing. Will you not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? So revival brings joy. It brings rejoicing. Philip went to the city of Samaria and there was a great move of the spirit. The resultant effect was that there was joy in that city. There was joy in that city. Will you not revive us again? That's the cry. Revival is a cry. And that cry must go forth from our secret places. It must go forth from our group meetings. It must go forth from our church meetings. We must really show that we need and we desire strongly this move of the spirit. You know why? Because revival comes with a cost. When you say, God, revive us, are you sure you want that presence to come? Because the presence will place a demand on you and on your lifestyle. You will need to expose some things. You will need to sort out some things. You will need to fix some things. Are you ready for that? So, you know, when you say, well, okay, why don't we have revival? Some people even make jest of it. They say, we've been crying for revival all these years. We have not seen it. They don't know God. When revival comes, things will not be as, we, this kind of meeting, we won't be able to wrap it up. It will just flow on. There will be mighty things. The glory of God will fill everywhere. You won't want to leave this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Where do you want to go to? You want to leave God's presence, where you can feel God's presence moving, not just in miracles and healings, in mighty, marvelous things happening. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Three things revival seeks to achieve. It brings that strong, palpable presence of God, that strong desire for everyone around that, you know, place, that community, that territory, to get rid of sin. And thirdly, it spreads and affects the wider community. It affects the wider community. Soul winning, you know, discipleship, evangelism, kingdom expansion. But guess what? As a round of tonight, many times as believers, we want to give an expression without having an experience. Revival is not first an expression. It is first an experience. You know, somebody may not experience the, you know, the true God, but he wants to give expression. You know, you don't need to know a manufacturer to be an agent of that manufacturer. There are a lot of people that are marketing products. They've never met the manufacturer before. A lot of people are marketing God too. They've never met God. That somebody opens the Bible doesn't mean the person knows God. Though. That the person even has some of the products from that manufacturer and is marketing it doesn't mean he knows the manufacturer. That's why it's possible for a person's life to be incorrect and the person is experiencing testimonies in their meeting. Very possible. Very possible. The Lord, I mean, judged Moses. The Lord wasn't happy with Moses with striking the rock, but water came out. The second time. He struck the rock against God's will. God wasn't happy with him because he had breached a major thing and he was going to pay for it heavily. But water still came out for God's people. So you can be striking the rock and water is coming out. It doesn't mean that you have a correct life with God. As we round off tonight, revival is a cry. Revival is a cry. Revival is a cry. It's a cry. You see all, I mean, all through scriptures, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord will raise up a man. But you know, these are days we don't just need one man. We need a, a, a hydra-headed organism. The church, I mean, people rising, and that's the idea behind Fusion Network, that there will be the coming together of graces, you know, providing that balance. So there is no, I mean, skewing off concentration risks and issues God is raising an army, not just one person, an army of people for this end time move. Hallelujah. Amen. 
If you've studied revival very well, the Azusa Street revival, revival, one of the things that affected it was the fact that Charles Parham did not buy into it. Charles Parham should have been the father of that revival. He's called father of Pentecost, if you've read God's General. But he didn't father that revival. As a matter of fact, he criticized and castigated that revival. Because he had questions, things he didn't understand, and because of that, he sent word out that he wasn't in support of what they were doing. And all the balance that William Seymour needed, as someone that didn't, I mean, wasn't as deep as Charles Parham, all those things were just playing out. There was division, there was different kinds of, you know, infighting among the people at that Azusa Street until that revival eventually broke off. And of course, people still picked some sticks of the fire and took it to other places and it exploded there. But the center could not hold. The center could not hold. That's why it's important for us to learn from the fathers, to team up as sons, to build up. But you know what? While the, where the learning is concerned, Kenneth Hagin has a wisdom for us as we pray tonight. Kenneth Hagin spoke about a dear man of God, one of the God's generals, who operated in so mighty power that there was a time he called doctors to come and see a miracle. There was a woman with a malignant, big malignant by her cheek. He told them, just watch what will happen now. Pulled the malignant off her face in the name of Jesus and told them to, told them to check it immediately. They checked the woman's skin. It was like the, a baby skin. But Kenneth Hagin said, follow this man's faith, but don't follow his lifestyle. So as we learn, as we study, there are things to follow. There are things to separate. Or else you will repeat the same mistake and God will not have a witness in that generation. Until he finds a witness, the second coming will not happen. The revival may not come. So instead of making the same mistakes, while giving honor for the contribution of that man of God, Kenneth Hagin told some of the people that were following him, follow his faith because there's a lot to learn from this. You can't come and criticize this kind of thing. But there are things you should not follow because that man had some other issues that they weren't to follow. I'd like us to pray tonight. Revival is a cry. Revival is a cry. A cry has to go from your spirit. A cry has to go forth. Revival is a cry. It's 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 a cry. Revival is a cry. Lord, we want to see your presence. We want to, we want to experience your power and your glory again. We want to see you move in our midst again. We want to see you move in our land again. We want to experience your visitation again. Lord, we want to see you like never before. Our generation may not have experienced this, but we desire it, Lord. We desire it, Lord. Our generation must praise your name. Lord. Let a cry go forth from you today. 